Hello, welcome to episode 32. A quick disclaimer before we get to going last week. I put the audio for episode 30 in the episode 31. If you go back now, it is episode 31. A legend emailed me, thank you so much, and let me know that that had happened. Oops, a daisy, because I saved the file name wrong. Hey, get as I say, you get what you pay for. Zero dollars does not get you much today in this economy. Am I right or am I right? <laughs> Enough whinging. How are you? Are you safe? I hope you're well. I hope there are no narcissistic abusers messing up your life. They should just booger off and leave us alone. Yeah, yeah. So this episode is going to be heavy, heavy, heavy. Uh, I'm going to try and touch on it lightly and not get too deep. I always say that and then I start telling you stories and just oversharing as per usual and it gets deep. It just it goes to those places. So we'll see where we go, but... I'm going to try not to get too deep because it's really emotional and it's why I have put it off for so long, this one. It's sexual assault and DV. What's sexual assault what to do with DV? Is it part of DV? Well, welcome. Here we go. Insert a jingle here if you had a podcast filmed in a studio that had funding. Okay. <laughs> enough laughter it's getting heavy it's getting heavy right so why is it heavy sexual assault and dv yes unfortunately it is part of it at times obviously not every abuser not every has raped their person and not every victim has been raped by an abuser however it is commonly a part of it and I think it needs to be discussed as part of DV as one of those things that can happen in DV and it's nothing I it's something I have not touched on yet at all even when describing things so because it's oh just when I think of it it's just oh it's a lot there's a lot of emotions there so I'm just going to try and do a little share now and just talk and the words will come out and just try not to overthink it. Try not to. Okay. Anyway. Oh, I didn't even say where you were and what you were listening to. I mean, you know, you're not dumb. Uh, I didn't do the intro where I say, hey, this is Love is a Battlefield, the domestic violence podcast. And I'm Tilly Moore. And this is episode 31. And I don't know what I'm going to call it yet. I think I'm going to call it um, sexual assault and DV or sexual assault and domestic violence or what does sexual assault have to do with domestic violence? But that's too many words to fit on my little box. <laughs> so it's going to be called something like that, all right? I'm disorganized. You get what you pay for. So <laughs> let's get into it. Right. Uh, I, yeah. Oh, where should I start? Uh, <laughs> so the bad one, the one that went to prison, you know, he was, I mean, he still is. I mean, he's alive. Evil. Like this person is such an evil manipulator and horrible human who has done horrific things to not just me, but m other women. And so it is no surprise that of all the bad relationships I've experienced in my life, that it's the one with him where this extra evil bad has come along. So, okay. It's hard. It's hard. But being an overshare, it should just come naturally to me. I don't know. I'm just trying to think why is it hard? Because it's em it's embarrassing. I don't know if it's because patriarchy in society has taught us to be shame filled with shame when people do this. I think because we we blame ourselves and we think it's our fault. And because Yeah. You you'll see, like when I explain what happened, it's because Traditionally, we think rape is, um, you know, pinned down violent fighting and struggling to get away from them, not this other calculated, manipulative, um, gaslighting kind of non-consensual, forced, weird, you know that, you know, there's, mm. and 
but your gut knows, your gut knows. Okay, I'm talking in riddles. <laughs> That's what we do when we're like diverting and avoiding just getting to the crux. So here's the crux. Actually, sorry, I just, I, I just stopped that. Like I just pressed pause for a bit. I'm actually really like the feelings in my body right now. I know you're like, just spit it out. Like you're getting there. <laughs> it's obvious what you're going to say, but I was going to get into detail because nothing's ever black and white when it comes to SA. Uh, but just, I'm just so like, I want to share that. And cause this will help you. Like if you've gone through anything like this and you go to talk about it, the way you know it wasn't right and it was wrong is when you go to talk about it, how you feel in your body. Like I just suddenly feel like emotions, kind of like crying, but confused and just this tension in my body and just, yeah, like emotions, like you, you want to cry and like this tension in your body and just sick and this horrible feeling. And that in itself is telling you, Hey, what you're sharing, it, it, it's real. It happened. It affected you and it's, it's not okay. So if you've had any experience with being sexually assaulted in any way, shape or form, and when you go to talk about it, you know, you're laughing and it's all good and you think, oh, that was nothing. But then if you go to talk about it and you're like, oh, I just don't feel comfortable. I feel weird talking about this. I feel motion and not right like that's your body telling you hey not your body it's not like your body it's like your brain i'm telling you hey something bad happened to you that's not okay so that's yeah usually i can as you know as you know as of listen as listeners of this uh trashy podcast you know i can i just say anything I'm like yeah then I was strangled and then I was like nearly went to heaven and whatnot and then he held me hostage and he punched me in the head and gave me a concussion like I will just I will just say all this stuff that happened and then I'll put in like a really dodgy joke thinking I'm hilarious and you're like no you're not but like I can usually say things nonchalantly but this is quite chalantly <laughs> can you use like those words like that is the opposite of nonchalant, chalant. <laughs> like I'm so chalant right now. I'm feeling I'm all up in my chalants. <laughs> and here I am using humor to cope and manage. Although, while funny people like me, uh, if I do blow my own trumpet, uh, I have a trumpet. I used to play trumpet in high school, so I can do that. Actually, I can blow my own trumpet. I've still got it tangent but while people are funny and yes they use it as a coping mechanism it's still nice to be funny and have a laugh like it's still nice to use humor I mean to lighten situations but yeah okay all right fine fine I'll stop piss farting around that's Australian saying for anyone who is in the wonderful amazing countries that listen to this podcast that are not Australia, piss farting around <laughs> is an expression and it means like you're stuffing around. It just means, oh, you're just dragging things along. Like you're just stuffing around. That's another way of saying it. You're just, oh, you're just like just wasting time. You're not getting to the point. You're piss farting around. <laughs> oh, my goodness. If you are in like Latvia or the UK or America or somewhere and you go just like try and put it in conversation randomly tomorrow or something and you're like so like let's not piss fart around guys you're gonna be like what the fuck did you just say so don't recommend using Australian slang out of Australia even in Australia like we all use it a lot but still sometimes we're like mm. Is that where you say that? That sounded kind of weird. It's still, we're all still confused here anyway. Okay. So it's nine minutes, 35, spit it out. Right. Yeah. There is shame around it. So when I started seeing this piece of human excrement, no, this, <laughs> when I started seeing this evil monster, horrible person, when he was grooming and love bombing and being all the amazing fake 
character things at the start, I had made it clear that I did not want to partake in actual activities until marriage or engagement or something. I'd been through a lot and was trying to avoid more drama and more relationship crap and I also um, believe in oh, don't hate me for saying this I believe in Jesus but I'm not I don't believe my favorite musical is Book of Mormon so um, do with that <laughs> that's like a contradiction not really uh, I organize religion run by like men and stuff can be an issue so I don't believe I don't like people judging people I don't like anything like that but I do believe in God and Jesus so it's like I do watch who I tell that to because I think they're going to think I'm like on the side of the road with one of those signs hating people which is like it's evil <laughs> and so no I'm not like that but I was kind of trying to just clean up my act a bit not clean up my act but it was dirty it was more like I'd been through stuff a single mum and we'd been through like trauma and so I was trying to not rush into things because I know my panani is attached to my heart it might not be for others like slay but for me I know that you know when that comes into play I'm like oh I'm so loved up I'm all the neurochemicals <laughs> and I'm very attached and so I was trying to just play it careful put off the sex um until more of a commitment more down the track kind of vibes so so more like maybe yeah down the track more committed not like necessarily marriage but more just more serious and knowing the relationship is right and I can trust them and everything so yeah stupid um because <laughs> that when you try and do things like that it's not good. Like, oh, here's a share. Yeah, tangent, but totally worth it. To totally hot tea. Uh, I realized that two times in my life, I went looking for a God-fearing man, like someone who would sit in church with me if I went to church or someone who would like believe in God or something with me. Like, so I wasn't like alone in that. Two times, both times I found a demon, like one was a pedophile and then this one who tried to murder me and stuff. So do with that what, what you will. Uh, so if you look for certain things, you're not going to get it. You're going to get the opposite. So I should go looking for like a Satan worshipping demon and I'm going to get like the nicest guy. Literally. No, literally that would happen. Literally. Like, because they, like people who society and like judgy Christians view as bad are usually the sweetest, nicest humans ever. And people who are in high society and all like that and in good standing with the community are usually secretly pedophile rapist wife bashing pieces of crap so you just can't tell but anyway so I was just trying to do anything and everything to prevent more trauma to me and the kids after going through stuff so I was trying to avoid the sex because I had had lots of long-term relationships uh some may say a serial monogamist as in serial like long-term relationships and uh I wanted to hold that off because I didn't want to stuff up and again so it was more taking things seriously and trying to like yeah be serious and not make any mistakes but in doing so <laughs> They come to you. You try not to make the mistakes yourself. They do door-to-door -door delivery service. <laughs> they will find you. So don't think you can have any control of your life whatsoever in making it safer. Oh my gosh, don't, I never, don't cut that bit out. That sounds bad. That's, imagine someone go, I was listening to this podcast, this is what she says, and then just cut out that sound clip. Nothing you do will make you safe. <laughs> that is so bad. Speaking of toxic. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, it was so many weeks in love bombing, um, all the, you know, 
oh, my person talks like he was just really pushing to get those neurochemicals attaching so he could have power control because he was a very very calculated person and as I've said I wasn't the first so he knew what he was doing and oh this is bad I don't I shouldn't share this it's bad I haven't shared this with like my children my family and I don't anyone I don't think really no maybe what a counselor a dv counselor once um yes <laughs> maybe don't put it on a public podcast hey if someone else has gone through it then and it helps them that's what this is for clearly not really getting anything else out of it are we <laughs> fuck stop deflecting okay so uh yeah so i'm not i'm not going to the nitty gritty um but yeah i'd made it very clear very clear talked about it we had talked about it he agreed as they do they agree to literally anything you say because they're just trying to get those connections going being like yeah 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 i'll just agree to everything i'll just be like amazing for the first whatever months and then i'll just start terrorizing her and destroying her life because that's normal uh, and so um we were uh, he was like hustling me and stuff and then he just did it and I was like what your first like there was no the and you know how he tricked me gosh he's calculated so before he kissed me me even though i think yeah we had we had kissed before so it was i found it weird that he asked this because it was before he kissed me he asked oh is this okay so it gave me this whole mm, this is weird he's asking for consent for one kiss so it tricks you into thinking he's asked for consent but he asked for consent for a kiss like, oh, is this okay? And then to kiss you. So you're like, oh, geez, really asking for consent. So it kind of tricks you to feeling this false sense of security when, and that's one of the tricks. I mean, this is like psychopath, like narcissistic abusers. I don't think they're all this calculated and this well thought out. Like, he's, this guy is not okay. And then, you know, you're doing stuff. And then it gets to the part where normally in normal relationships, it's, it's, it's established what's about to happen. However, like in a normal relationship, like if, if the girl had said, look, I don't want to have sex, I don't have sex um, until like engage or married or something like down the track. Like I, I really, are you okay with that? And made sure the guy was okay with that before the first date, you know, like before meeting, you know, um, because it's online thing, because that's where you find the, good psychopaths uh, no, no, that sounds so bitter but like in other relationships they'd be like wait a minute you like we've just and they'd stop and like you talk about like but you said you didn't want this and stuff like that so I mean I had made it clear I had had many discussions before meeting after meeting like I had we had talked about it a lot that that no no, it was off the cards for a long time kind of thing. And so he asked permission for a kiss so that he could trick me into thinking he'd ask permission for that. But that was down the track like that. It was not, it was, it was clearly not um, for that. Definitely. Cause I'm telling, like, I'm not going to go into detail, but it was so like, yeah. And he had, I think he even admitted to this once, he had purposefully waited to kiss me. So like, you know, when you've got, you're hanging out, you're pretty much, you're dating, you're seeing each other and you know, you're waiting for that first kiss. It's so awkward, uh, especially if you're sober. And so, um, so waiting and then you're waiting for that first kiss and he just like wouldn't for 
longer than like the time came when you just knew it was going to happen and like he he wasn't doing it and so that gave me this other false sense of security that oh he's so respectful like he's waiting so long and and he implied oh no I'm totally respectful but it was all a facade he wanted me to be in this false sense of security state to think oh he waits so long and you know eventually he did it and then yes I've never forgotten the first night um he did kiss me he was moving himself like just in kissing like a man who had been around the block if you know what I mean like he (laughs) had been around the block he knew what he was doing he had the moves like this is just kissing but he he had the moves you know player moves like I don't know ladies can you tell like if you are having a kiss and a hug standing up like with a guy like he even pushed me like against a wall, like what? Um, and he was acting like a player would, like a guy who is very sexual. Yet he was trying to sell me this story that he's just this, you know, girls don't, you know, like me, you know, like I'm just so innocent and everything. But I was like, no, because I'd I'd heard that before, like guys selling this whole, oh, I'm so innocent, and then you know, you find out they actually are a player and you can tell, like, there's a song. It's in his kiss. That's where it is. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, You can tell, like, if they're, like, no, like, if they're, like, you, like, I could just tell. He's, he, he's a, he's a player. He knows, yeah, he's, he knows what he's doing and he's all over that shit. Like, this is not, like, a, quiet shy little nice guy having a first kiss with a girl this is a guy who's like hey ladies like you just I just know it's hard to explain but if if you're a girl a lady a woman and you've dated men a bit you just know so so I had made it clear you know I don't want that but he you know just did it like forced it and I'm shook. I'm like, wait a minute. And so your first thought as a woman, because you've been taught this your whole life is to blame yourself. I was instantly thinking, was there a communication breakdown? Like what's going on? Uh, did I imply something before ages ago when he asked for permission to kiss me? Was that implied that I was giving permission for sex? Um, even though I had said over and over and over, I didn't want to do that. Um, wait, did I make this happen? Did I make him put that in there like did I no okay and so you just you you're going over you're in shock and you're going over it and you're thinking oh you know and you don't feel safe and because this person has forced it you feel like you're just in shock and you're confused because it was never meant to happen but he set it up like he tricked you to think maybe maybe it's me maybe I did say yes maybe I did no I said I didn't but you just like maybe he got his wires crushed that yes to a kiss before definitely meant yes to doing whatever the hell he wanted and so you're like you think if you just go no get away like Half of you is thinking you should do that, but then the other half is like, I don't want to upset him. I don't feel safe because who is this person? What are they doing? And you're just like, you went on to date this person. Like this person fully gaslit me that somehow I had consented when I hadn't. But straight afterward, like I was like, I didn't consent. And he's like, yeah. And gaslit the shit out of me. Like, yeah, you did. Like, yeah. And I'm like, I told you I didn't want to do that. Like, I didn't want to do that until later on. It's so weird. Like, and that I think that's where the feelings come from and the shame because it's like there's so many women who go through that sexual assault where they're just, you just go fight, flight, or freeze. And for some, I'm always like a fight, fight or flight. I'm not really a flight, am I? Or if you have to run from like fire or something, um, or bullets, <laughs> like freeze. I didn't think I was much of a freezer, but I think it's something to do with sexual assault where I think a lot of women freeze. And you've, I've heard that from so many women who've been raped that like 
you just freeze and you go over, wait, what's happening? How did I get here? Wait, did I consent to this? Am I confused? Was there a communication breakdown? Wait, did I entice him to do this? You know, that whole, well, you were kissing me. So of course, like, you know, you wanted it, you know, and he said that you wanted it so much. You were gagging for it. You wanted it. You wanted it big time. Like, no, no. Uh, he knew, no, he knew, like I had made it so clear, but when you're in the moment and you're in that, it's like when you're young and you're not sure what you're doing kind of thing that you just go into this weird, like what's happening. And I've heard that same story from so many women who've been sexually assaulted that they just freeze instead of fight. Although there are many instances where people like, usually when it's a stranger, in public who just grabs you violently that's the fight situation but when it's someone you know you go freeze because you're going over did I like you don't want to offend them you don't want to get them aggressive when they have full control of your body and they could really really hurt you you don't you just like wait did I say something did I do this because you know them when you know them you're in shock and you freeze And it's obvious you don't want it because I can tell you I did not. You can tell like the the person's frozen, you know, it's not like a mutual making of the love. Like it it was, it's obvious they're being raped, sexually assaulted, whatever you want to call it. I still struggle to empathize with myself enough to call it the R word because of freezing because I didn't fight. If I had fought, I'd be like, right, right. From day one, right. And guess, get this. And because I didn't know I'd been raped, like I couldn't even go near the R word that day. It was, I I was still thinking, was this communicate? I'm still frozen. Like I'm still thinking, was this communication breakdown? What happened? He says, I wanted it. Did I, what signals did I give? Because, you know, women, we, we think, is it what you're wearing? Is it what the eye contact? If you give a guy eye contact, well, you're asking for it. Um, you kissed him. Well, that's a yes. That means you want it. So I was still blaming myself, like saying, you know, in, and then not fighting, you know, I didn't feel safe, Like, but then I went in a relationship with him because he'd convinced me, well, he tried, but deep down I knew, and I'd brought it up with him and said, I didn't consent. But anyway, so what happened was, uh, because I didn't want to do it. I wasn't on the pill and hadn't had protection or anything. And cause he just randomly just raped me. <laughs> um, you know, and it's like, I've been in relationships. You get to that stage, you have the talk. You're like, when it's about to happen or it starts happening, you're like, <gasps> wait, have you got a condom? Are you on the pill? You know, guys will always ask you. They, they always, it, you always have that quick talk. Like it's always a thing. He didn't, he flew past that. He just went shove and he knew what he was doing. And he also hoped because he tried this with the one before me to get me pregnant so that I would be trapped to stay with him or be in his life. Or if I leave him, I lose my child because he's very good at manipulating. And that's what he did to the one before me. So he, yes, this man had previously raped someone to force them to get pregnant and stay with him and then to leave him and save their life. They had to um, sacrifice, like not see their kid. It's a big story. I've sort of nearly touched on it before, but said I didn't want to go there too much because it's not my story to tell. But yeah, so this person knew like, and that was a trick he was trying because it, it worked in keeping this one before around longer. And then, well, she had to, you know, not have her kids to leave him and it's like well who's going to leave their kids I don't leave my kids so he thought oh yeah this one will stay so I think there was a definite uh intention to try and get me pregnant so he never gave me a choice in condom pill or anything like that and then he just it was late at night there was work the next day or something so he went home and then he Yeah, then I was like, I've got to have the morning after pill. Like, it wasn't a discussion he was having with me. He was just like, oh, yeah. And he was trying to deflect and gaslight me and everything into just 
letting this be there and not doing anything about it. And I'm like, um, so you want to start a family? What the hell? Like, I didn't say what the hell aggressively like that. I am now <laughs> angry, <laughs> but I was just like, so if you're not going to like give a chance for a condom or ask me if I'm on the pill, like, does that mean your family planning? Like you want to start a family with this person you've known a couple of weeks, like what was going through your head? And it's just like, oh no, you know, we're making love. Like we're just so caught up, like both of us, you know, we so wanted like just gaslighting. And after he left, like, cause you're in shock, you're just like, huh? What the hell just happened? And I realized, no, I'm getting the morning after pill. Like, cause this guy had all the neurochemicals coming into my brain that were all the juicy, loved up neurochemicals. And I was like, wow, this guy, it's great. Blah, 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 blah. And you can get caught up in that and not really think on your feet. I was not thinking I was in shock, but I, luckily got to the point where I was like, no, I, I need the morning after. I'm not having a baby with someone I've just met. I'm not doing this to myself. Like I'm going to go and get the morning after pill. So I sent him a quick text to say, oh, I'm going to go get the morning after pill. And he said, I'm coming back to you. Like he lived suburbs away, like 20 minutes away. And I was like, no, I'm okay. Like, it's just going to the pharmacy, you're getting this, like, it's no biggie. He's like, no, you need support. I'm coming back. So in hindsight, I know he's coming back to control the situation. And he was scared what I would tell the people, the pharmacist. Me, I have no idea. Like, I am so like, ping, like, I still cannot compute. So here's, here's something, here's a story. I went to the chemist, pharmacy, whatever you you call it a drug store in America, <laughs> a drug store in America. Don't know what it's called other places to get the morning after pill. It's an over the counter. So you just got to ask for it. And I think they put your name on it or whatever. And they have to ask you, they say, oh, as they're giving it to you, they're like, we have to ask you, was this consensual sex? And I was like, oh, I didn't want to do it. No, I didn't want it, but it wasn't rape. And the look on their face. Oh, like I was just not picking up what the, was clearly being put down by like the whole scenario. <laughs> like I was so like still in shock. Like I had no idea. Like I was just so gaslit already. Like these, I've known this person. Oh, I've known him for months. So there was already the psychological kind of connection thing. And then I met them in real life and it was like, oh, loved up. Neurochemicals. And this person had been grooming the living piss out of me for months, I guess, at this point. So I was so groomed, gaslit, love bombed. I was just, yeah, right under this person's control and didn't even know it. I still think, I'm still thinking it's early days. Like, we'll see what happens. Like, all, oh, you know, I was about to, like, it was a week away from him getting interviewed and assessed by family and friends because I just met them. And then it was like, no, this is going to be like a relationship I'm going to seriously get into. So it was just before that. So I'm so I'm already, I don't even know that I've already lost control of my brain. I'm like out of it. This sounds so, and this is another reason why those emotions obviously came up. Cause it's so like, really like, you're a person, you're an adult. Like, why do you not know what's happening? Why are you not switched on? Like, it's these people brainwashing you. Like, that's such a huge part of DV when it comes to narcissists and psychopath kind of personality disorders in that they do brainwash or we call it manipulating or gaslighting their victim. And I was so in that yet still knew get the morning after pill but it was still at the counter it wasn't until her face went and she went what did you say that you didn't want to do it and I realized that that sounds like rape and I went oh it wasn't rape it wasn't rape no it wasn't rape no it's okay to think that I told them instantly when they said oh, we have to check, you know, was it consensual? And I said, I didn't want to do it. Like instantly I said that, but I still had in my head that old patriarchal 
misogynistic view that rape was you actively fighting for your life to get them off and then refusing to get off, which it is. I mean, that is. I didn't. So I was of the mindset it wasn't rape, but it was non-consensual. I don't know if us as a society at that time had come to realize rape was also any non-consensual sex. It wasn't just violent, back alley, forced. So I myself didn't know the definition of rape, really. I mean, so I blamed myself for not trying to fight him off, even though when you're frozen, you've sort of quickly assessed, like it's just safer to just let this get over with. And so many survivors say that. So there's so much self-blame here. But to think I said to them, I didn't want to do it, as if that's a normal woman's experience. I was like, oh, yeah, I didn't want to do it. Like, Because I assume so many women don't want to have sex. A man makes them have sex. That's why you have to get the morning after pill that you were made to have sex and you didn't want to have it. But, oh, it wasn't rape. It would but the look on their face made me just like backpedal because I thought, oh my gosh, no, like I'm not reporting rape. No, like, and that's why he was coming back because he was hoping to get there and go with me there to control the situation. But I, it was just down the road. I just went there and he got to my place um, just as I got home and he sped, like he would have been doing a hundred and something, 20 Ks an hour in a 60 K an hour zone. So if you know, if you have miles per hour, wherever you are, like it's like 60 something, maybe 70 miles, 80 miles per hour in a 40, 30 mile per hour. zone. I don't know, but it's like, you know, double the speed and here you get massive fines for speeding, but he, yeah, got that, did that sped very much sped to come and control the situation. Whereas I thought, oh, that's nice. You feel for me for that, for having to take the morning. He's like, oh, if you have to take that, you know, I feel for you so much. Like I want to be here to support you through this. He wanted to cover his fucking ass because he knew that by me getting to the point in my head where I knew I needed the morning after pill, that I was also going to get to the point of, in my head, I've been raped. So he had to come back and do the in-person gaslighting because he knew I have text messages from toward the end of the relationship. You know, when I was reading emails and stuff out recently, I think it was emails or text messages or something from that period of time where he, you know, it was the one I read where he said, in person, we have to see each other in person. You come better. You do what I want when I see you in person because he knew his manipulation in person, when you have eye contact, physical contact, when you're in person looking at each other's eyes, it's easy to manipulate someone. So he saw, wait, if she knows she needs a morning after pill, she's about to figure out she's been raped. I'm getting back there. I'm going to lump on her. I'm going to make sure she knows I'm supportive and everything. And I'm going to make sure she does not figure out that I just raped her. What the fuck? <laughs> That's what I know he was doing 100% now. Like, don't get me wrong at the time, you know, I was piecing it together. But when you are under this psychological warfare, literally, they're actually, people are using that terminology now for narcissistic abuse, psychological warfare, psychological terrorism, because of the way they F with you and your head more than anything. And then the physical comes in and the media and society and the law, justice system, look at the physical side of things but the mental like and that's what that uh coercive control law is about that you can't you know brainwash people and threaten people into controlling them it's going to be hard to police but it's good that there's acknowledgement of that so it's more of that coercive control so I was completely under this already but kudos to me for breaking out enough to figure out I need the morning after pill and look at him going into self-protection panic mode, screaming back in his car. There was no reason 
to come back, I was saying, you don't need to. I'm fine. I'm just taking a tablet like it's all good. Like that's one of those subtle red flag moments that he had to come over and he had to be so supportive. And you're thinking, oh, that's nice to fly speeding in your car all the way back just to be with me when I take a tablet but then I have to go to bed because we have work tomorrow. <laughs> like, it was really um, unusual when things are just unusual, a bit weird. Usually that's a red flag that there's something else going on underneath. There's something underlying happening that you just haven't cottoned on to yet. And saying this, it's easy to say in retrospect, like everything that happened, but at the time you're just facing things as they happen. And so it's really uh hard to sort of differentiate what's actually going on at the time but looking back it's like oh and then so during obviously I went into a relationship with him because I was convinced that it was a communication breakdown and you know what he convinced me of then (laughs) fun fact he convinced me that oh well because we've done it we just have to keep doing it I mean you've already broken your whole I don't want to do it until whatever moment thing with yourself you've already broken that like because I had because apparently it was all on me you know (laughs) and um so you know let's just keep doing it now because we've done it anyway I mean what's the issue and then (laughs) he was trying to convince me that we are spiritually married like you know so you know God's good with it too you know everyone's good with (laughs) they just convince you of anything and everything to convince you of whatever makes them get what they want so that's that story but after that in the relationship we did have disagreements about that like I'd bring it up and say you know I never did consent the first time and he'd be like gaslight 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 you know all the things and so he panicked I believe that night he panicked and covered himself you know I know what he did to cover himself for raping me so yeah, besides flying back to try and intercept at the pharmacy, lucky I was so stupid. I mean, it's not our fault. You've been brainwashed, so you you think, oh, but it, it's so easy from the outside to think, gosh, you're stupid. But if I had had, a, if I hadn't panicked when I saw, was asked like, oh, you said you didn't want to do it. If that conversation had gone differently, uh, he would have been arrested. Uh, and I would have gone for a rape kit, you know, like things would have gone differently. So he was trying to intercept that. But besides that, he was also in a panic because I was like, I didn't consent. So, I mean, now, like having been on TikTok for years and just learning more about everything, I, and as as a society, we now know, no, sexual assault, rape, it's not just that one thing that we were always thinking when we were younger. So now, look, if it happened now, it would be a very different outcome. But he was obviously trying to intercept that. But he was also seeing, oh, my goodness, she's brought it up that she didn't consent. I've got to cover myself. So you know what he did? He wrote a fake journal. I was not introduced to this journal by him because, you know, he had control and power over everything. So I couldn't just look at things. He um, showed me or something at some stage, but not years, like a long time down the track. And he'd used this journal with police to con- because he had written this fake journal that he happened to start that night. I think he backdated it to, to um, yeah, other dates. But he had written, uh, oh, you know, I have all these feelings for her. Oh, tonight we made love, which, okay. How many men say made love? Like you might be in a relationship and you might say, oh, you know, it was really good when we were together last night or something. It it felt more like making love than the F word. It felt more like making love than sex. Like it felt more close and stuff. But what guy who rapes you? So it's not a making love really connection experience. Let me tell you that then goes and pens in a book. And also he said he had told a friend because, yeah, the next day I was like, oh, have you told anyone? He's like, I told my friend that we made love last night. I'm like, he told his male friend. I said, you went to your mate and said, we made love last night. And he's like, yeah, because we did. It was magical and special. Like it wasn't, you know, like 
girlies, 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 you know when it's like making love and it's like fucking rape. <laughs> you know like when it's a quick fuck, rape fuck, and it's making love. Like, but he was trying to, like, this is all part of conditioning me, gaslighting me to believe that that it was a consensual loving experience. And so there's no way he said to his mate made love. Now I know he lied. He It was just telling me that. And so he had this journal where he would write in it, oh, you know, I like her so much, have all these feelings. Oh, and then we made love and all this stuff. And it was so weird seeing it written. It just was like, what the fuck? Like by this stage, I'd been well abused and was trying to leave him for the whatever time. And it was just like seeing that in black and white, like you've made love, like what? And it looked so creepy. Like it creeped me out. It gave me the ick and not saying made love because made saying made love in the right context, in a relationship context, it's beautiful. Like it's amazing. But this was not that. This was completely creepy and major flags, red flags. Like it was reading it. It was like, what? But now I know he'd written that to cover himself. And he actually did use it at one point. I didn't end up going to the police about it because as you know, I was so gaslit and it took me so long to figure out that happened. It actually was once I was well out of the relationship and he was in prison, I believe, uh, that I was talking to a DV counsellor and they had to ask me um, if that had happened. And I said, oh, yeah, I didn't consent the first time and told them the story and ended up crying And because it's when it really – because I was like, oh, but, you know, it wasn't really rape and that, but, you know, I didn't consent and this and that. And they're like, hey, that was rape and all that. And, like, we had that discussion. I'm like, really? Like, isn't it on me to, like – figure that out in the moment and not freeze and like fight back and that. And we had that whole discussion and, and just being like told, like you've been raped and something. I was like, and I went, I knew it (laughs) on the phone besides crying and being emotional. I was like, I knew it. I told him, I told him, I'd said to him, I never consented the first time. And we'd had so many discussions and he always turned it around on me and said, no, 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 you wanted it and blah, 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 blah. And they're like, yeah, he was gaslighting you. Like he knew, he knew he raped you. And yeah. And so the penny start dropping as to why he raced back so quickly. And then uh, now like not finding out ages later, and I've only just pieced that together now that that journal was made to cover all. Actually, no, when I saw it, I knew it was to cover the rape. Uh, yeah, and to make it look like, oh, like, it's just a relationship and loving. Look, I wrote this journal. I'm completely covered in a court of law now, literally. And he did pull that out to use it once when he had domestic violence orders against himself and he was trying to do that revenge, get a DV order against your victim thing. And so he used that to say, look, I'm such a loving person. I love this girl so much. And he put the pages in with graphic making love stuff in it about us like the judge and the courts don't need to read that like that was that's freaking creepy man and he put that in saying this is my journal like showing you know what was happening around that oh actually I hadn't even reported the rapes but what was happening in the relationship and to show you know how sincere and obviously he's showing an entry from what the rape because it's the only entry he obviously ever did just to cover himself like one entry uh literally and oh no no but he had other ones because he'd written notes yeah that's what he did so every time he was abusive he'd obviously go to this like journal thing he had and make more notes and they he was penning it like it's a journal to talk about his life and loving me but he was actually writing his defense of what happened so that if I say on X, Y, Z date, he held me hostage, did this, took my friend, blah, blah, blah. He would write, oh, we did this. And, oh, you know, she was really upset last night. She wasn't herself, you know. And so he would write his little story of defense so that he could easily, and he'd write the date so he could easily come back to that and go, well, look at my journal. I said that she wasn't well and she was acting really aggressive that day. So that's obviously what was going on because he knew 
journals hold up in a court of law so you can use a journal as evidence so he had this whole journal and every time he was abusive he'd write an entry in it and that entry was you know how liars people say how do you keep up with all your lies that's how he did it he had it there ready as like a backup if I ever went to the police so he can say oh well no like look at this date and look at this date to cover his ass you can't just do that mate like he went to prison like don't worry like no one bought into his shit, but he had it there. And these things do work in justice systems. They find these little Weasley ways to get around actual crimes they're committing. Ugh, ugh, disgusting. And reading that, like getting this document from the police and reading this court approved and stamped document talking about making love to me was like, um, how is that significant? Yuck. What? Ew. And then that journal, like him showing it to me eventually or somehow something like that. And me seeing all these entries where he had written his fake version of events for the date. So he could always come back and say, oh no. And, and he didn't have to think on his feet. He had these rebuttals ready. So if you're going to be violent to someone or rape someone, just have your fake little journal far out. That's why I always say this guy is next level. But narcissists are manipulative AF and they are calculated. Like they're all a bit like this. But this guy, I'm like, this is next level. And it's not, it's mostly because I wasn't the first victim. He had done this before. He'd used all these little tactics to get away with it. He was quite cocky. So he had leveled up in his whole plan like he knew what he was he knew what he was going to do to me because he knew what he'd done to the one before me so he had his whole plan set out before he even picked me as a target and yeah then he just went to town on it like this is like <laughs> his whole career in life is just being like a psychopath anyway so speaking of previous victims we had disagreements many times about, oh, no, I didn't consent. Not arguments. And as I've said, DV is not an argument out of control. They were just disagreements where I'm like, no, I didn't consent. And he's like, oh, well, must have been a communication breakdown because you, I know you did and I know you want to, like, just gaslighting. Like, it, if you, like, you know when you know. Like, it was so obvious. He knew what he had done. And now I feel like even like sicker and creepy, like just knowing he knew he raped me. And now like it's only been since I've been talking to you that I really, the penny really dropped on him racing back. I always knew he raced back as some like controlly thing, but now actually saying it out loud, it's like he knew what he'd done. He did that. He did the journal. And because I got to thinking morning after pill, he had to come back and gaslight me because honestly, if he didn't come back, and just reiterate all the things that he was trying to brainwash me with. I could have got to thinking, hey, that wasn't consensual. And I could have got a rape kit gun done. He had to make sure I was going to bed, going to sleep. Knowing he, I wasn't going to go and get a rape kit done. That I was going to be under his control. He had, because if he came back and I started saying, I didn't consent, I'm going to the police. He would have killed me. And you just think, well, that's that's extreme. Well, he kind of did already. Um, yeah, he had that in him. <laughs> so he would have held me hostage and done all the violence and probably killed me. Like, honestly, he would have done something. He would have faked a suicide or something. Like, he would have, not faked, like staged, murdered and staged, you know. He would have done, like, I would have been in danger. But he had to have control of that situation. So he then went home eventually knowing, yep, I convinced her I'm okay. She's not going to get a rape kit. Like, the penny has really just dropped on that since talking to you. So, hey, look, podcasting, therapeutic. <laughs> great, great. So anyway, speaking of other victims. So the one before me, uh, when I had left at one point where I'd left for the longest time I ever left for before he went to prison. I was finally free in the end, this chunk where I'd left, I finally reached out to them and said, Hey, don't want to be sound crazy, but I just want to know, like, did he ever 
hit you or was it a bit abusive or is it just me? Like, it's probably just me. Like, I swear it was just me. I've actually described this before in an episode. And the reply I got shook me, shook me to my core about the absolute violence, about the rape box. There was a box of apparently like ropes, handcuffs. I don't know if it was like tapes, bags, violent things. I like weapons. I know that there were definitely like ropes and maybe handcuffs or something. And Oh, some weapon thing that she got hit with if she didn't do what he said or something. She described this box and she said, I call it the rape box because every time it, that box came out, I'd get raped and beaten. Like, it's not my place to say, but I'm freaking saying because there is no identifying information in this. And this girl has not ever had a voice. She's still controlled by him because she still thinks he can murder her grown children. I mean. I was a grown adult. He nearly murdered me. So, you know, I understand definitely as a mum, you want to protect your kids, put them first. So it's a very tricky situation. I was about to do a deep dive and tell you all the things she told me he did to her, but it ended up being like a whole episode length. Like when you think about like what I have to tell you it would be like at least half an episode. So I might save that for another time, but I will on this sexual assault topic, tell you what she told me about that. So she was telling me about all this violence. It was horrific like oh my goodness yes I have to tell you sometimes it's beyond it's a lot uh and then just drop the oh and the rapes and I'm like my heart sunk and I felt sick instantly I because this is before I talked to the counselor like the counselor dv thing that came like once I was free 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 like this is like before that so I hadn't called it the r word I just told him I didn't consent as soon as she said that, I was like, I fucking knew it. <laughs> I know mean, I'm laughing. I'm laughing because of the way I fucking knew it. <laughs> like, Bogan, like, yeah, mate. <laughs> Swearing. No, like, I knew. Like, in that moment when she dropped that, I was like, oh, my goodness. He raped her, she said. So, so she said the whole relationship, but she said, obviously, in the start, the love bombing and grooming and everything and she's in love like she's consenting of course um because you know it's a start of a relationship but after she started trying to get away from the relationship and escape which she tried multiple times to escape him and i'm not gonna go into detail obviously because i'll go on tangents about what happened there but he would um find a way to have contact with her and then rape her and he would rape her and rape her and rape her until she got pregnant. And then she went back to try to stay away from him. But she obviously was pregnant and scared and alone. And it was their third child. So she came back to him. And because grooming, love bombing, let's not blame her. Manipulation, gaslighting, all the things, all the mind fuck that these people do. So it's not her fault. And she came back to him and she was like, yep. Our third child is from rape and he raped me over and over and over and it, my jaw was on the floor. You know, I'm really glad I'm not giving any identifying information about this person at all because this is really full on. Like this is full on and I also would not want um, the person's kids as they grow up or whatever to learn this from me. <laughs> So I, um, yeah, I hope that she, I did tell her, like, are you going to tell the kids? And she's like, one day when they're old enough. And it was just like, oh, I just, uh, is it a problem with me? Like, I'd tell mine. Like, I'd just, anyway, <laughs> I'd just blab, like, because I'd want them to know that that person is not a safe person. You know, you're teaching your kids about safety and you have to lie that this person's safe. Um, but she knew the danger it could put them in if they confronted him. So like, it's a dicey situation, but anyway, yeah, he raped her many, many times and hearing that instantly for me, it was like, I knew it. I knew he did. And I told her, I said, yep, first time with me, it was that, but he convinced me it wasn't. And she's like, yeah, yeah, he does that. And it was just hearing that from a victim of the person you 
have been, you know, abused by. I mean, I didn't want to hear that. I expected to hear, no, he he was great. He was a wonderful partner. We just grew apart. You know, that old chestnut that people say. And to hear that, it was shocking, shocking. I honestly didn't expect to hear that. And so, but it also confirms it's, it's not your fault. You're not the first. It's not your fault. And I'm not the last now. There's more. So it's, it's disgusting. So in summary, well, I'm not at uni, at uni, every time I wrote an essay, my last paragraph, in conclusion, comma, every time, every time through my entire degree, in conclusion, comma, (laughs) and then I just rewrite the point of the essay. Oh yeah, I didn't do too well. (laughs) But in summary, so sexual assault, can be part of domestic violence, linked to domestic violence. It's not legally under domestic violence. Like if you have been raped or sexually assaulted or you're confused about did I consent or did I consent or anything like that, anything like that's happened, they're separate charges and they'll probably be under the DV banner in Australia where they get like a lesser sentence than if they don't know you, you're a stranger or something, who knows. But they are separate charges like, you have to report, report, report. I, of course, I wish I had figured it out that night and he hadn't raced back to brainwash me more. Of course, I would have liked to have got the kit done and then got effed him off out of my life. Oh, my goodness, how good would that have been? Oh, to just get him out of my life then and there. But I probably, like, he probably wouldn't have gone to jail because it's his not his word versus mine. I mean, you get the rape kit done, you got DNA, but still the consent argument. I mean, there were witnesses that we were, you know, starting to date and um, I think, you know, kiss and hug and things like that. So you would have had to convince a jury that I said no when it looked like we were getting together in a relationship. So yeah, it still would have been a tricky one, but it would have been good to just get out then and there, you know, hindsight. They say hindsight is twenty twenty, as in it's perfect vision. You can see things clearly in hindsight. And yeah, um, I would have loved to escape early. And every time you go through abuse, you just, you, you know, you do this yourself, probably if you've been through it, you just think, oh, at this point I could have got out. Like there was a moment, but I stayed. Don't blame yourself. The psychological part of abuse is what keeps you there. So you are already being abused. Me being convinced I wasn't raped was part of the abuse, the mental part, the part that convinced me, oh, that didn't happen, was being abused. So all the non-physical stuff, all the mental stuff is part of the abuse. So if people are like, oh, she's stupid. Why doesn't she leave? She's stupid. She was with that guy. Oh, she's stupid. She chose that guy. These people are world-class manipulators and they do this psychological terrorism or psychological torture or whatever you want to call it. So that's part of the abuse. So don't ever blame yourself for not being able to think or see things clearly while you're in the presence of an evil piece of shit. (laughs) I really, I need to work on this in therapy. I need to work on not calling abusive men pieces of shit. It's offensive to shit for a start. Um, Saying evil, that's legit. That's right on. I mean, it's literal facts, but, and things like that, but um, not putting them down as pieces of shit. (laughs) <laughs> because I've always just talked about the behavior, the crimes they commit, the behavior they do to others and separated that from the person. But lately I've just gone off oh, piece of shit. <laughs> what a piece of shit. <laughs> Every time I hear about abuse or think of this particular abuser, it's like, oh, what a piece of shit. Oh, you piece of shit. <laughs> and it's like easy to slip into that. No. I have no regard for this person. They're not even a person in my head. Like they're just, there's no thought at all to this person thing. It's just all I talk about is the behaviours, the crimes, what they did, and that's it. I'm not going to 
call them names because then they go, you call me names. So now I have to like strangle you. Um, mate, when they say tit for tat, that's not tat. <laughs> if I give you tit, your tat has to be a tat, not a fucking demolition. <laughs> Anyway, good to be laughing at the end after that. That was it. That was a lot. Oh, who's going to listen to this? Fuck. Who's going to listen to this? This is a lot. Who wants to listen to this? Trigger warning. <laughs> I say at the end of the episode, trigger warning. I'm going to write it in the title. I'm going to write it in the description. Sorry, I didn't say it at the start. Sorry, I don't have good, like, any editing software. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm pretty sure the topic would have given it away and that's why people who find it a trigger can avoid it because that's why I've avoided it until episode 32 it saved me 32 episodes to actually talk about it um I still feel that shame in sending this out there that you know someone's going to listen probably a man and say yeah well she didn't fight back so it's not rape and that was my way of thinking at the time too but I maintained it was non-consensual and it was obvious. It was so obvious, so obvious that it was non-consensual. So, yeah, you know, he is lucky that he only went to prison for one set of events and he didn't go to prison for like that uh, at the start. So, and this guy was so cocky, he, he'd got away with, abhorrent crimes to a victim survivor before me uh, who has permanent injuries and everything and you know he's got away with so many rapes so much violence so much torture uh, violent acts against children that's another thing I'd like to tell you and probably will maybe I'll put that in an episode just say things about their part I don't know what I'll call it but um what they'd done to her and what they'd done to children and stuff like it's and not giving any names or identifying information places towns facts anything yeah I could be making this up I could be like Delulu I could be like more Chowsons by telling stories (laughs) no proxy just by stories I could be an attention seeker who makes up stories but I don't get any attention for doing this like I get none So it's not really working. You'd think you would have given up well before 32 episodes. But no, it's good. There's no identifying information. So, hey, it could all be bullshit. You never know what. I mean, if you're going to make up a story, I think you'd make it better. Anyway, each to their own. So, guys, I've been talking for so long. Like, it's all your fault. Stop listening. Gosh, it's all your fault. (laughs) Anyway, I'm going to go. Thank you for listening. And that was heavy. I hope you're okay. And I hope no one hurts you. Fuck. Because if you want me to call them a piece of shit on your behalf, I really will. Like, I <laughs> shouldn't, but I will. Stay safe. Love you, legends. Thank you. Just thank you. Thank you. Bye. Oh, wait. Stop. Come back. <laughs> Email me. L-I-A-B-F podcast at gmail.com or it's in the description, the details of like the episode on Spotify and YouTube. Bye.